Each day in the second video, I will talk about uh, one of the world's great religious traditions. I'll, I'll be talking about 11 of them, and we have 18 of these, of these videos. So in the other videos, I will also talk about some of the tools or methods that we use in the academic study of religion to study the world's religious heritage. But today, before that, I'd like to say a few words about how Sir John Templeton's approach relates to the more formal academic study of religion. And one thing to keep in mind is that uh, although Sir John sees his book as what he calls an academic study program, and he organized it so that it was 40 weeks long with lessons for five days in each week, um, it, it, it does differ from the academic study uh, of religion in that his focus is clearly not just intellectual, but it's also profoundly spiritual. It's profoundly personal. Uh, and I can say that that is also true for me. I've been teaching religious studies or comparative religion for almost 30 years now in public universities. And so I have always tried to keep the personal and the academic distinct. But in this setting, that's not really necessary. And if I weren't passionately interested in religion and even a religiously sensitive person myself, I, I probably would not have dedicated 30 years to talking about religion. It's the only thing I'm really interested in. I talk about it and think about religion constantly. And it's pretty clear that that was true for Sir John Templeton as well. As he writes, the limitless potential of wisdom from world's religions can be so powerful when shared. That's an eminently practical interest. It's not a merely academic interest. Um, I mentioned in the last video uh, that Sir John Templeton has given 200 spiritual laws. Um, these ordering principles or spiritual laws can also be thought of in terms of what, uh, of the Sanskrit word dharma. And dharma comes from a, a, a root in Sanskrit that means that which holds everything together, that which sustains things. And so these ordering principles are, are Sir John's attempt at trying to express the eternal wisdom that is always there, whether there's a planet Earth and a human race or not. It's something like, I suppose, the rules of arithmetic, which in one way or another, in a universe like ours, will, would be uh, invariant. And so the dharmas or the spiritual principles are always the same. A good example is that of the golden rule. It doesn't vary from one context to the other, even if it's expressed in different languages. Or the gesture of human beings in praying. Most human societies have had people who pray. They're very, it's very rare to have a society before the 20th century in which there was a kind of uh, uh, rejection of prayer in, by the government. Uh, so the gesture of prayer, the spiritual message of prayer, is that we finite beings can turn ourselves and open ourselves to the source of ultimate well-being. That's what prayer seems to symbolize. Prayer then is one of these dharmas as well. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind as we go along is that although uh, Sir John began life as a Presbyterian, in fact, he was always a devout Presbyterian, he was also a, um, a board member of, at the American Bible Society, he was a trustee at Princeton Theological Seminary. However, one thing that's extraordinarily uh, different about Sir John's spiritual trajectory is that he became, he may not have used the word himself, he became a religious pluralist. Christian as he was, rooted in his Christian tradition, he was also open to the universal spiritual truths that have been discovered by the great explorers of the human spirit, regardless of what part of the world they have come from. Now, I myself am a religious pluralist. I'll have more to say about that as we go on. And what that boils down to is this, that no human society, no religion, no group of people owns the truth. No one owns mathematics. And similarly, nobody owns the basic dharmas or spiritual teachings that make for a, a fulfilled life and that can guide us towards salvation, towards moksha, towards ultimate freedom, or as Sir John uh, phrases it, heaven on earth. No one owns these principles, and yet we can all use them. It's just like we can use mathematics, we can use the grammar of our language. No one owns the grammar of any language. It's a common possession. It's like the mountains and it's like the oceans. They're owned by no one and yet usable by all. 
So we'll see that Sir John uh, takes his spiritual wisdom from whatever corner it comes. Uh, and this is why he calls for those who encounter his writings, uh, and whether they're religionists from one religion or another, and he also makes this same request of scientists as well, and of people of science, is to have an inquiring and open mind, an inquiring or an open mind. Um, so that's an essential skill for a course like that, to have an inquiring and open mind. Um, when we approach the study of religion, it's important to keep in mind some that there are skills that we can make use of. Well, for instance, uh, very, very central to the practice of a religion is hearing the religion's message. So we need to listen or to read or to hear a sermon, to hear a talk, or to read a scripture, or to read a description of what it is that this religious tradition teaches. That's essential. Without that, we could hardly even commit to such a tradition. If we go a little bit deeper, we, might, we may discover, especially in an academic context, that the study of the, the scriptures in their original languages and their original context is essential to getting a clear idea as to what the religious tradition is about. If we go deeper, we may find ourselves engaged in field work, uh, going, uh, engaged in archaeological activities, all of, and all of the other traditional practices of a university involving, um, involving uh, uh, the learning of, of languages and the learning of history, uh, the study of, of, of ancient periods of time. Uh, other disciplines also these days are starting to be brought in from the sciences, as in contemplative neuroscience, which study the effects of prayer and meditation upon our brain and the relationship uh, in positive psychology between spiritual practices and the reduction of stress and the increasing of human flourishing. This is all now part of the study of religion, and those are intellectual skills, academic skills, scientific skills. Alongside the first set of personally cultivated skills that are essential to deepening one's grasp of one's religion, hearing, reading, participating in community, are a number of special skills that need cultivation. One is, instead of not merely to just read or to hear the sacred text or sacred expressions of our tradition, but to deeply reflect upon them, meditative study or reflection. You know, we have so many distractions in our lives today. I mean, you probably, there's a smartphone, there are computers, there are just so many distractions. And we often give a lot of attention to these distractions. I can become so absorbed in my smartphone that I forget everything else. Imagine if we had that kind of absorption in a sacred text that we completely forgot the world around us, sort of like when you get caught up in a good movie or a good book. That kind of concentration that leads to absorption. This is the kind of reading of sacred text or the hearing of sacred information that can really make an impact upon your life and your consciousness. Uh, what flow, flowing naturally from that kind of reflective or meditative study is prayer and meditation. In fact, it's hard to imagine having a vital spiritual life uh, f without engaging in some kind of spiritual practice like this. Prayer, and meditation. Uh, it requires a good, a little bit of explanation to distinguish prayer from meditation. Let's just say that at the deepest level, contemplative practice is essential, uh, where we withdraw our attention from the external world and we go within and we make the spiritual discoveries within that only that inward turning can bring. And what will we discover there? Well, this is uh, another aspect of personal spirituality, and that is in these times of reflection and quiet contemplation, we will start to see that profound life-altering insights will emerge. We, within ourselves, have our own teacher our own guide is present within us, but we often are so caught up in external matters that we do not hear. And so that the third practice is to cultivate the insights that come, that arise as a result of our turning within, inspired by deep reading uh, and deep hearing of the message of the world's religions.